Welcome everyone to the Environment Sector Read with our special guest, Jennifer Wilhoyt. We'll be talking about her book today, Winged Seals and Snowy Summits, Stories of Passion for Place and Everyday Nature. I'm Kate Trinka and I'll be your host. I am the lead ambassador of the Charters Environment Sector and so happy that you've joined us. Next week at the same time, I just want to make a few announcements here. Next week at the same time, the Charter for Compassion will be hosting Jean Shinoda Bolin, and we'll be talking with her about her book, Like a Tree, How Trees, Women, and True People Can Save the Planet. And then in July, Joanna Macy will be here with us talking about her newly released book and her work that reconnects. And then finally, the Charter's Education Institute has a course coming up that you might be interested in. It's called Mindfully Reconnecting with the Natural World. The course is scheduled to begin next month. Um, one other housekeeping detail before we introduce our guest. Um, if you have any questions or comments that you'd like me to pass along to Jennifer, please put those in the chat room and I'll do my best to get those to her near the end of the program. Uh, now, I'm so pleased to welcome Jennifer Wilhoyt and I'm excited to hear about our newest book, Queen Seals and Snowy Summits. Jennifer is a spiritual ecologist, the founder of TLR Stories, and the author of books, articles, and blogs focused on the inner and outer landscape. If you miss our Go we'll Read with Jennifer a couple of years ago, uh, she spoke about her book writing on the landscape. You can find uh, the recording on the Charter's Global Read webpage. And to learn more about Jennifer and her work, please visit her website at www.tlarborstories.com. Dot com. Jen Jennifer, uh, thank you so much for being with us today. We really appreciate having you here. Thank you so much, Kate. That was a beautiful introduction. I am, it is an honor to be here again with the Charter for Compassion. Um, and to have another conversation about books with you, Kate, is really exciting. So I, I can't wait to see what we do today. <laughs> I know, me too. It's always, it's always the truth. Um, I was hoping that you wouldn't mind starting out reading just a, a small segment of your, of your book. It's from the last section about being a spiritual ecologist. Um, I think it's going to set the stage for like the rest of our discussion and, and cue us into like the heart and soul of who you are and the work that you do in the world. So yes, uh, you might. Thank you. Nope, I would love to. Thank you. I just, I want to hold the book up so everyone can see it closely, even though I know you had a beautiful intro screen with an image of this. And I want to be clear that this is our book. Um, it's a co-authored book. It's my first and only so far co-authored book. And I wrote it with a, a phenomenal human being named Stephen B. Jones, PhD. Um, and We'll talk a little bit later. I think Kate will have some questions for me about the structure of the book and how, how uh, one goes about writing uh, a co-authored volume. Um, but I, I, I really want to make sure that, that he also gets the byline on this um, because it's, it's half his book and half my book and together it's our book. So I'm going to turn to um, a chapter I wrote called Being a Spiritual Ecologist. And I'll just read a few paragraphs. The term spiritual ecology is most simply used to refer to the spiritual dimension of our present ecological crisis. Practitioners within and outside of academia, conservation, and religion recognize and have begun to create a body of work that supports this idea. There is a divine spark, an inexplicable and awesome miracle in which spirit and matter converge. In every tree and lake, robin and rabbit, estuary and glacier, microbe, beetle, butterfly, krill, grain of sand and spawning salmon. The sacredness is in earth and it is the same holiness each one of us carries within. It connects us for better and for worse. When the earth and her inhabitants are hurt or destroyed, so too are we. When the soul of this planet is crying for healing, 
so too is ours. The earth reflects our being and we mirror it as well. As the environment becomes fragmented, more species become extinct, the crisis requires us to move back into participation with the sacred aspect of being, our own and the earth's. Recognizing that we are in union with the natural world and actively working to reunite with it is a spiritual calling. The natural world has always been a place of healing and restoration for me. As a young girl growing up in a very urban environment of cement sidewalks, paved streets, asphalt blacktops at school, and modern vehicles and conveniences of all sorts, the word nature took on an almost otherworldly shimmer. Every ornamental cultivated species, which composed the majority of plants in the gardens and the small yards of my hometown, was nature and belonged there. I didn't have concepts for things like non-native species or words like endemic in my vocabulary until decades later. I loved them all. I bemoaned the chores that included eradicating something growing from something not growing, like the weeds sprouting up in the earthquake cracked cement driveway. My six-year-old self rooted for those green gifts and was frustrated trying to tease out adults' notions of weed from desirable or cultivated. Any grassy lawn, flower or bush, walnut, crow, or snail, especially snails, however isolated from the thriving ecosystem of interspecies relationships and physical features of which it might once have been a, a native, was definable to me as nature. Not only were they nature, I knew that I was inexplicably part of it all. Um, wow, thank you so much. Um, that's, just, that's just wonderful. Um, I, I, thought, I thought it was going to set the stage, and I think it definitely did. Thank you for taking the time to do that for us. So Thanks getting for back to um, what you said, too, and I, and I do want to ask you about that. There's certainly a different structure to this book than most books that I've read before, um, and that's obviously because you've co-authored it. Um, what was that like, and, and how did you come up with the themes, and why separate chapters and all of that, if you could just talk to us a little bit about that? Sure, sure. Um, so I have known Steve for some number of years. Um, we've had a lot of conversations on phone and Zoom and Skype, um, and he has a couple of books that I had the privilege of um, assisting with um, at, at the end stage so that we could get them ready for publication. And so out of these conversations between Steve and myself grew this um, connection, unseverable connection, um, that, that was passion for the natural world. And um, it, uh, just sharing very personally, there are probably every email I get from Steve, I know exactly how far he's biked and where he's bicycled or where he's hiked in the moments before he's gotten on to, to send to me an email. And probably for me, almost every time I'm, I'm telling him about the weather conditions outside or something I've just done that involves the natural world. And that was just a bond we had right from the beginning. Um, and so at some point, knowing that Steve is a very fast writer and I can be a, a fast writer when I put my mind to it, we decided we wanted to write a book together and we wanted to talk about the shared passion we have, hence the, the subtitle of the book, um, for the natural world. And we wanted to try and see if we can convey that in a way that made it really kind of contagious for the reader. Would, would the reader, could the reader actually read our stories? Um, and, and feel some connection with the natural world or free, feel inspired to find their own way, their own connection or deepen their connection to the natural world. So that was sort of the, the impetus for the book. And then through many discussions, we decided that we, um, we, we had different enough voices, we have different enough voices that we, we didn't know how it would look to actually, you know, a lot of co-authored books 
you just pick it up and start reading and the chapters aren't designated um, as being the, the, the words of one author or another, but because our voices are distinct enough, we wanted to really clearly convey that to the reader. So we opted to write chapters individually to alternate his voice and my voice, Steve's voice and my voice throughout the, the book. And so in the table of contents, it's very clear. There's a chapter title and there's an author. Um, and we wanted to do that partly because we wanted to preserve one another's voices. Um, and in terms of how we came up with the topics, we knew we wanted to focus on some kind of ecological concepts, but not to talk about them from a um, an empirical or, or in a sciencey way necessarily, so that's definitely Steve's forte and, and background. Um, we wanted to really tell personal stories as well as a little bit of professional stories to, to help the reader along, to give the reader um, a, a, a gift of, of sharing an experience and, and hopefully having them be able to connect to that in some way. So we didn't want it to be a textbook or, or a science tome. Um, and so we had a lot of concepts we wanted to talk about. We had a lot of concepts that we decided we didn't want to touch. And so we chose five concepts, which are transitions. So five concepts in regard to ecology, transitions, islands, diversity, niche, and spirituality. And so we each titled our chapters the way we needed to, to sort of fit within that. And then we took different um, kind of perspectives and went with what we knew for ourselves um, as we wrote the chapters. That's, that's neat. And you're right. I mean, there's two distinct voices, so I could see why you decided to do it that way. It was really an interesting, you know, way to re to read it, you know, and to, like you said, different takes, which is really cool. Yes, um, yes. So I, I was, I was thinking, like, when I started reading your first the first part, I'm mostly going to talk to you about what you've written because, uh, you know, you're here. And so um, <laughs> Thanks. it was, it was interesting, like, um, the very first theme was ecotones uh, in your writing. And, you know, I hope I'm not the only one who wasn't familiar with the term, although, of course, I recognize what an ecotone is. And I absolutely love this word now. Um, but for those in the audience that may not have read your book yet, can you just provide them maybe a brief definition of what an ecotone is? Sure, thank you. Yeah, I, I'm kind of a, a weirdo about ecotones. I'm so in love with the, um, the word and the, um, and the idea. So a, f a friend years ago, actually about a year before I went in to, to begin my doctoral studies, a friend of mine introduced me to the term ecotone. I had not heard of it before either. Um, I was probably in my late 30s at the time and had been studying environmental and ecological things, so it was just not a term I, I was familiar with. And the very briefest definition is that it represents an ecotone is a convergence of two or more distinct biological areas in the natural world. And a very simple example is where a meadow meets a forest. And so you see the forest trees and you see a meadow. And actually it was perfect because about six months after my friend introduced this concept to me, I happened to be living on a farm in New Hampshire, um, a, a, about 15 minutes drive from, from a, a, a moderate sized town where I had my, my job in, in my grad school. And I was living on this farm property and they had a hundred acres and right outside, I lived at the top of a barn that was converted into a, a, an apartment. And so I'd stand out on this old wooden deck, um, three stories above the ground. And there was this meadow of grasses and dragonflies and um, uh, lightning bugs and all kinds of lovely things. Um, turkeys that would walk through the yard and other wild creatures. That was the meadow and mostly they would let it grow tall and once a year they would mow it down. Um, and then at the edge was this surrounding forest where all of us who lived on the property would hike. There were a number of apartments on the property plus the owners lived on the property. And we all used the property to hike and explore and find respite in nature. And it was, so when I, I learned this, tone, this, this word ecotones, I actually ended up doing a little mini study in one of my classes, looking at what is that transition between the forest and the meadow. And my goodness, it's so simple at a distance to look out and think I know where that, that boundary is. But when I walked out into the field and started seeing that 
there were things from the forest, um, both both tree matter, um, uh, leaf litter and things like that, that were creeping in that had fallen onto the meadow side of this imaginary boundary. But there were also things, little wildflowers and things from the meadow that were creeping up inside the forest proper. And so I realized the boundary between those was so you can't just take kind of a, a a magic marker, you know, and draw the boundary. There's a lot of overlap. And that's what makes an ecotone especially rich in biodiversity, because it actually contains some species from what however many adjoining biomes, separate biomes there are. And I... I can hardly speak. I get so excited <laughs> about this idea of diversity um, converging in a place. And also, um, there are particular species that will seek out ecotones because of that richness of having a lot of different kinds of resources available in one area. So I write about ecotones until probably some readers are sick of it. But <laughs> I, I love the 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 ecological idea of it. And then, of course, I use that a lot as a metaphor for human life and human nature. Yeah, it, I mean, I'm totally in love with the word too. And also, the, I mean, just, you know, being a lover of the natural world, I have always recognized them and, and have always appreciated them. But the word is just really fun. And anyways, yeah. when I when I read, I just read like maybe, I don't even know how many sentences and it just, I was like, I have to write this down. And I just, I don't hope you don't mind, but I want to share what I wrote it. And, and Please. It's, what's so funny is as I read on, it was something that you you basically repeated and said anyways, but my, I was so excited. I said, I, I, I love, well, let me throw my glasses on so I can actually read this. Um, I love this concept of ecotones. And for some reason it made me immediately conjure up the notion of ecotones in my life wondering how I got here from there. It wasn't a leap from one moment to another, but this subtle gradual transition from one point in my life and a stepping toward another. And if I paused, I could see where I had been and where I was heading to. What comes to mind was as without is so within. Um, so as much as, as you and I enjoy the um, ecotones of nature, it makes me ponder if I need to take more time enjoying the ecotones of my life instead of rushing mm -hmm. toward the next thing. Yes. And, then, and then, you know, I was like, I didn't realize that you were going to talk about other ecotones. And I was like, oh, she already just said that. <laughs> what, I, what I wrote, which of course that makes total sense because you and I just, you know, think, think a lot alike and which makes yes, we do. <laughs> very easy. So, um, so thank you for doing that. Um, on, on page 16 of your book, in a, um, you, you wrote, um, often the transitions in our lives do not exist in a vacuum. Uh, we experience changes over time and sometimes over space. We can understand these as ecotones too. And then you went on to say every moment can be an ecotone, a transition from this to the next. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure, Kate. Um, but first, I want to say I, I want to thank you for sharing your writing and um, that you that you came to that and then found my voice and and seeing how our voices echo. I think that that's um, you know your work with the charter and I know your your own doctoral studies and your professional work being so so integrated with the natural world. Um, is, is really, you're an example of what this, what it is to be a human being who's connected to the natural world and feeling the rhythms and finding that seamlessness between human and nature, because in fact, right, we are connected. So I just wanted to highlight that for, for our listeners today, because um, your work is really important. And also I'm going to put out a shameless promotion, which is that I, I believe you're going to be teaching a class for the charter. Um, using some incredible arts and um, ecological concepts that you've put together in the form of cards. And I'm very, very excited about that class. So I hope people will check that out um, if Kate is too shy to actually share more details about that. But um, thank you. That's, that's amazing work. Really, really amazing work. So sorry, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know if you wanted to say anything more about ecotones or if we should, you know, move along into one of the other topics, which is 
either way is fine with me. <laughs> well, gosh, since since you and I love the topic so much, we'll just keep talking about what we want to talk about and hope we can bring the audience <laughs> along with us. Um, sure, I'd like to say say something at least, which is, um, I, so for a long time, I've been a hospice volunteer. I'm very passionate about that work. Even um, I started actually when I was working on my PhD and um, um, you know, I was working a number of jobs and, and, and doing my studies, but I've always had heart for service. Um, in fact, I have a, a book about that in my computer that hasn't seen the light of day yet, but it will one day, about community service and the importance of offering ourselves as volunteers freely to our community in various ways. And so I, I joined up, I got trained as a hospice volunteer, and everywhere I've lived um, for the past 20 years, I found a, a way and an organization, a hospice with, with whom I can um, do this work. And so I found myself um, 10 or 12 years ago when I, I had a, um, was doing a lot of volunteer work, less on, on the professional work and the paid side, and a lot of um, hospice work. And I found that I was writing a lot about those hospice experiences, being at the bedsides of people who are transitioning to, to what lies beyond what we know and what we experience every day. And every time practically that I started writing about that, mostly in the forms of journals and of course um, uh, with HIPAA laws and, and my own sense of um, uh, attending to people's needs for privacy and confidentiality, of course I wasn't putting these writings out publicly, but I was every time referring to ecotones and I realized that, that ecotones are a perfect, um, uh, a, a metaphor for how things move and shift in life, including that ultimate transition to what lies beyond life. And, and perhaps on the other end too, right? As, as a, a, a mom is giving birth to a baby, there's that transition. The baby doesn't just come and you can mark that transition wherever you want. You can mark it at the time of conception. You can mark it at the time of the woman finding out that she's actually carrying a child within her. You can mark it at the moment labor starts, but then where is that? Because what if she has, you know, false labor? I mean, there are all these um, ambiguities and gray areas. And so I love that. I love the, the, the unsureness, kind of the gray area of not being this and not quite being that. Um, and so when this book came out, someone dear to me, and I hope the person doesn't mind my sharing this story. Um, I'll try not to give any identifying info, but somebody very, very dear to me sent a text message to me saying, oh my goodness, I just read your Ecotones chapter and I'm headed to a class, a brand new class about death and dying and mortality. And I would like to share some portion of this chapter with the people in the group. Is that okay? And how might I do that? Knowing that the book is published and copyrighted and all of that. And I was so struck and moved by that message that somebody who is um, moving into a stage of life where that conversation with himself is emerging that conversation of oh here's a turning point maybe there's some retirement in the near future um you know what how do i give back to the world how do i serve and i would I, so i think that when we consider ecotones when we think about the transitions of our lives just like with the the example with the meadow and the forest we can't really mark now and later, and especially with death, I mean, a lot of us don't um, have that knowledge um, in, in some factual way of when and how that eventuality is going to, to unfold for us. And so rather than being um, saddened or dismayed or um, reluctant to talk about those things, I find that, that using ecological concepts, one of which is transitions, ecotones, and landscapes as a way to understand it's natural out there. It's natural to have the, the ecotones between seasons, spring to summer, for example, the one that we're in right now, right on the cusp of in a couple of weeks, it'll be the summer solstice, and the way the light changes and the days get longer um, in this part of the world, that's all 
this ego tone, that transition. And so the more I find I'm able to connect the natural world, however that is, in this case with the use of a concept, to human nature, I think the more avenues it gives us to really step into our life um, as more deeply as humans, but also more deeply as um, living beings on a planet with lots of other living beings. Yeah, co-participants, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. Hey, I don't normally do this, but it seems to, I, I actually saw that in the chat room that we have a question. And so Great. if you don't mind interspersing uh, our conversation. Sure. Because it's about Great. Ecotone. So this is from Ellen. Um, I, have, I have loved the study and practice of ecotones in nature and, and, uh, and find it fascinating for the last several years and recently um, moved to the sea. I have become immersed in the rewilding movement and practices. Could, do you, is there anything that you can say about that, like re, a rewilding piece of things? Um, so honestly, I'm not super familiar with that as a as a term. Could could well, Ellen say something yeah, more? Yeah, I'll see if I can do more clarification. But also, like you know, um, like the 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 ecotone of the sea. You yes. Know, maybe you could talk about that and then maybe we can get some more clarification from Ellen. Yes, Ellen, please, if you if you want to say more about your participation in rewilding, that would be of, of great interest to, to me and I think to Kate. Um, but yes, that that um, that notion of the sea, that's another example. If it, if it's not in this book, it's somewhere I know I've written it, um, about the that transition between the the the, the sea or the ocean and the land. And again, tides are a, a, a great way of sort of, sort of seeing that. We have here in the Pacific Northwest, I live on a little island, a beautiful little verdant island and obviously surrounded by, by salt water of the Puget Sound. And there's something this time of year where the tides are just exaggerated. Um, and the other day I was, I was taking a drive just to keep my car up and running um, in this this time where I'm not using my car very often. And um, I, I hadn't looked at my tide chart for a few days and I looked and one of the beaches was just a mud flat for, for quite a distance. I wanna, I wanna say several blocks, however you, you measure that distance um, of just of, of sand, wet sand and then mud flats. And I know what that beach is. I've been on those beaches around here a lot at low tides and that the ecotone right of where the sea meets the land is so compelling. Um, and there's so much richness. And then if you if you snorkel or if you're a scuba diver, then you're in a whole other terrain of, of ecotoneness, um, ecotonality. And so I, I think just for us to begin to explore that is really important. It's important to our, our, our way of understanding, particularly now with the challenges that we're facing globally with a pandemic and also globally with um, justice issues, racial justice and economic justice, all um, environmental justice issues are, are um, just, we ought, we ought to be thinking about those. And, and I would say, I would, I would encourage people listening to all of us find our role and our part in that work too, because it's all about the planet. Um, and there, if we think about this time we're in as a transition, so we don't know when there might be, for example, a vaccine for COVID-19. And so how can we live in this uncertain time? How can we embrace the opportunity, which I think ecotones are, to find a new way to find compassion, to figure out how we will lovingly embrace one another, even though the circumstances right now of our lives look really different. Um, how will we embrace our, our friends and loved ones um, who might look and experience life differently from us? And how can we do that with great love? Um, so always it's back to compassion, ecotones and compassion for me. That's so, that's so funny because I was just gonna uh, talk about another quote that you wrote in there. One one was from E. B. White, 
Um, mm. I wake up each morning torn between a desire to save the world and a desire to savor the, the world. Yes. This makes it very hard to plan the day, he said. <laughs> and, then, and then you said, what lies between saving and savoring is compassion. And so mm -hmm. you just talked about compassion and, you know, obviously we're the charter for compassion. So we're, we're loved that you mentioned that. And, um, and we did hear back from, Oh, um, good. It was more, I think it was more a comment than, than necessarily a question. She said, simply we're all of a wild nature, but we've lost our way. Um, yes. So, so many spiritual practitioners and writers are helping people find their way back and connecting on a more deeper level and a more meaningful level. Um, she said, it's helped me shed my city skin and become one with my new environment, um, which, you know, is wonderful. And I think, I think when she was talking about the rewilding movement, it was that Micah Mortali um, person that, that came up with that, which I'm, I'm less familiar with, but uh, um, have, I'm aware of it, you know, so, yeah, so. Um, I just, I just wanted to, to finish that uh, for Ellen so that we, we had an understanding of what she meant. So, Can um, I jump in and, and respond yes. to Ellen for a sec? Okay. Please. So Ellen, thank you, thank you, thank you for, for, for saying that. And I, it, it's a term I know, but it's not a term that I use particularly, rewilding. Um, but what I, what I think I heard in, in your response, Ellen, is that, um, that, that, in what I call the inner outer landscape. It's the wild within and the wild outside of us. And how can we bring those back into communication? Um, whatever that looks like for, for an individual. And I think for, for each of us, it is individual. So thank you very, very much for your comments. <laughs> awesome. Your next section of the book was, uh, the, the theme was about islands. Um, mm -hmm. Is there anything that you'd like, I mean, there's other, so many things I want to talk to you, but is there anything in particular that you want to highlight from that portion of the book? Um, just the, the interesting, that ha interesting thing that happens when, for some of us, when we're writing, is the, the realizations that can come through the actual process of writing. So I've journaled since you know, I could hold a crayon practically. Um, I, I would make these elaborate um, journals when I was when I was a kid, when I was a teenager, um, and I'd get out my marks a lot, um, marking marking pens of different colors. And though I was working on lined paper, which I resist these days, lined paper, um, but I, I would. Um, get these spiral bound notebooks, lined notebooks, and I would use a color until I got tired of the color, and then I'd pick another color. And so I had these, you know, I might might have said the same thing over and over and over in my journals, the same complaints and the same boys I liked and the same whatever, but it was in these vibrant colors. So it felt like a new experience every time I would sit down the journal. Um, but I, there's there's something powerful about writing and getting an insight. And as I started writing the island, my islands chapter, I realized that I've had a long standing connection with islands. And so I write about that in the beginning of the chapter of any of you who, who have the book, you'll, um, and have read that section, you'll, you'll note that there are books and songs and um, experiences with islands all over this planet with which I've had the great fortune of, of being familiar and having some intimate experiences. And then of course I live on an island now, which is such a, an incredible experience for me. Um, and, and, and it teaches me something about interdependence. Islands teach me something about interdependence. So that's one thing I wanted to say about islands. And actually with no segue, it reminds me of something about co-authoring a book that I'd like to bring up that I think might be interesting to our listeners today. Um, so Steve and I wrote our chapters independent from one another. We knew what the, the topic would be and we knew we'd, we would each write a, a chapter on a topic, but we didn't really know how that would unfold. And so um, there was a, a, a moment for me, it's always the moment where I've kept 
the manuscript really close in, my little baby swaddled, caring for it, tending to it, editing it. Um, but there came that inevitable moment where it has to go out into the world. And of course, Steve and I were first readers for one another with this book, with our chapters. And so I was really nervous when I sent my chapters to Steve and we exchanged some emails uh, about how we would have a conversation on Zoom after we read one another's chapters. And and then I, I realized that it would be nice to actually maybe have a brief email exchange just before having the Zoom conversation. So I wrote back, Steve, this is great. There's some things I, I, I can't wait to talk about. Here are some things I especially liked about your chapters. And he also graciously responded with, with similar comments. And then we got on the Zoom call and... Um, I, I tell this story when I'm, I'm doing book events in, a, in bookstores and other venues, book readings for this book, that we got on and, and there were a couple of places where, because our voices are very distinct and the way we use words is very, very different sometimes, where we had to really talk about our, our one another's word usage and, and how that works. And, and so there were a couple of words he used that I, I said, I because they were in um, kind of a, so we have the introduction and the conclusion, which are more jointly written chapters, but it's his voice and my voice um, in, in each of those chapters too, even though they're, they're the voices combined into a, a, a one little unit, which is the intro and conclusion. Um, and I, I said, there are, there are these uh, couple of words that, that I can't, I can't live with it. Doesn't really jive with. And he said, "Okay, okay, I'll, I'll I'll change those." And he said, "But you know, you use the word dirt a lot." And I said, and he said it very kindly and and almost in jest, but but earnestly as well. And I said, "Really? Oh, yeah, I love dirt." I said, "Hunks of dirt, globs of dirt. I I love dirt." And he said, "Yes, but it's soil. It's it's." you know the the word the correct word is soil and I said oh my gosh I said well you know I'll, I'll look at those one or two places and see what I, I can do about that and he kind of politely cleared his throat and and didn't say anything else so I did that you know where you can go in the little search function in a word document so I went into my um my half of the manuscript and I typed in dirt and do you know that there were dozens and dozens of places where I had used the word dirt, not soil, not once had I used the word soil. Oh my goodness. And so it was that the beautiful thing about having somebody else's expertise and experience and wisdom is to point out those places, thank goodness, before the book was published, right? Um, to have that opportunity to understand more deeply. And, and, and as, as a um, forest ecologist, um, in, as, as a first career, Steve really taught me a lot about the importance of soil. And I said, but I, but I love I love dirt, whether I call it soil or dirt. To me, there's a reverence. And he said, no, no, dirt is something that, you know, you, you have to clean off your clothes. It's something unwanted. And I said, that's so interesting because the way I hold that is very different. Um, uh -huh. And I like to tell that story in, in book readings because it just highlights how, how different we are. But also, it's, you know, having enough passion and enough shared um reverence for the natural world that we can come to this um you know joint endeavor of a book one other thing i'll note for our readers is that steve lives in alabama um we're talking about perhaps doing a, a course together about wind seals and snowy summits and so we're in some early discussions about that um and he said in in an email recently he really wanted our our individual geogra geographies to be noted and, and to be part of this conversation about the book. And I live here in Washington state, he's in Alabama. And what some people find interesting when I'm talking about this book reading is I, I like to ask when I'm, I'm in an audience that's in front of me that I can see, well, so how long do you think you have to know somebody in order to write 
a book together? How long, you know, how many times do you get together with them in person or, um, you, you know, shared experiences and shared geography and shared time do you have to have in order to write a book together? And people raise their hands with all kinds of answers. But the truth is, Steve Jones and I have never once met yet in person. We actually <laughs> um, don't know each other in that in-person tangible way like you and I, Kate, have met and, and had lunch um, and a long conversation in person. Um, so that's very interesting, I think, for some listeners to see that you can find the common ground even when you don't share geography, when you've never been in the same room with somebody, not counting Zoom rooms, right, but the same actual space. That's in, that's incredible. I, first, yeah. I want to say I did not pick up the fact that you wrote dirt a million times or anything like that. I, I took a lot of them out. I took dozens out. <laughs> yeah, first, first, um, Steve. <laughs> well, Kat, Kat is in our audience right now, and she says that uh, I love the collaboration you mastered in producing your book. Oh, so, thank so you. That, that's a nice comment from her. Thank you so much. So the next area of your book, the theme was um, about biological diversity. And, and you talked about your amazing experiences on the seven continents. So many things to talk about here. I was particularly struck by three of your encounters, the, the, the gray whale, the koala, the seal. You, you, you describe not only in this chapter, but in, in all of your writing, things so vividly um, you know, and that just, I mean, it puts me right there. And I found myself delighted for you that you had these encounters. And there was a little bit part of me that was a little bit envious, you know, I have to admit. Sure, right? you know? yeah. And, and, and then I was quick to realize that, you know, um, something that you said at the end of the chapter, and I'm going to quote you here, um, it doesn't have to be about knowing everything related to biodiversity. We can do, uh, go a long way toward protecting by simply caring, by having a deeper meaningful experience with a particular species and fostering a sense of appreciation or even love. And we don't have to travel seven continents to do so. We can do it in our own backyards, local parks, a patch of dusty ground, a beach or a pond or with a single rock. And I and so it was very quick for me to go, I want to I want a pet a koala bear to, mm -hmm. oh man, I just had this really cool experience and I live right next to a park and you know, I saw this deer and it came out of the woods and it started walking towards oh. me instead of running away. You know, I mean so it, you know, but oh please share one of your favorite stories with the readers about your experience with one of those. Um if you wouldn't mind. I mean, it was just sure. I, I usually read the uh, the the baby seal oh. excerpt as as one of the excerpts. Would should I read that or just tell about it? What would you like? Oh, read it. Or read it. Whatever, okay. Whatever. Whatever works okay. for you. I, I just want to. We'll share see it. if my eyeballs can do this. Um, so I'm. It, I, I do want to underscore, though, that yes, I've been very, very, very fortunate and very blessed to have happened to have been able to go to these various places um, around the world, um, usually with some ulterior motive. Like I, Australia happened to be my seventh continent, and I there was a professional conference there, and I thought, well. This is a great opportunity to try to make it to Australia. I'll, I'll submit a proposal and see if it's accepted. And, and very fortunately, it was. And so that was my um, way to sort of justify being able to go to Australia, um, which is an incredible, incredible place. Um, so this is about Antarctica. Um, and I'm going to use a, a reading assistance device so that I can see better than <laughs> Alex. Um, so I'm on a, bur uh, on a beach in a, uh, a place called Gold Beach, which is actually in South Georgia, which is an island um, near Antarctica. It's not Antarctica proper. So here goes. I see a few and then a dozen and then suddenly a whole beach full of baby elephant seals, affectionately called wieners, as they have just stopped being nourished by their mothers. They are lumbering up onto land out of the frigid Southern Atlantic Ocean. 
Suddenly and irrevocably, I'm struck with a powerful affection for these creatures. They're nothing like me at all, and yet I feel sure I could communicate something of this love struckness if I could just get close enough. But I will abide by the strict rules that have been laid out for us. And this is about the Antarctic Treaty and their very, very specific guidelines when getting off a ship and onto the land in the um, Antarctic region about not bringing, for example, seeds that might be embedded in the, the Velcro in our jackets and um, being very mindful that these are wild creatures and we don't want to habituate them to us. We want to um, have the, the pleasure and the great fortune and the, the, the blessing of observing them, but without interference. And so the rules were, um, and I forget what the exact distance was. I don't want to say because I don't want to get it wrong, but there was a certain distance that, that we were required to keep from the animals. But if that animal entered into our space, if that animal, um, not knowing about boundaries, got closer to us, we were not necessarily required to move away. So I took full advantage of this in this scenario. Um, so let's see. I know these babies have spent their first few weeks solely in the care of a mama of their own species, but I want to lavish them with tenderly motherly affection of a human sort, petting their thick as yet unmarred hides, offering a hand for their olfactory perusal, and to kiss them on the tops of their wrinkled foreheads. Yes, kiss them. <laughs> But I am far from the cobbled tide line where these babies are congregating. I've chosen to be deeper back on the beach, away from the sounds of my fellow humans who have also traveled long and far to get to this remote island. Ah, island, there it is again. Mm -hmm. I want to savor the views, to linger in silence. But then I see that a few of the babies are making their slow going way in my direction. Every few feet, they are distracted by one thing or another, and it's inconceivable to me that they will ever bother to drag themselves this far away from the abundant curiosities of the waterline. I long to crawl, belly to pebbles, legs outstretched, and elbows reaching forward in small strides to arrive nose to nose with one of these wieners. These babies weigh almost as much as I do. Their innocence is palpable. Suddenly, I realize that one baby is actually heading directly toward me. Four yards, then three. Six feet, and then a breath holding me close, four feet. I get the I'm sitting. <laughs> I know, I'm getting goosebumps too, just reading it. <laughs> I'm sitting in a half squatting position, black ship issued rubber boots sticking out in front of my knee. This baby elephant seal has now approached much closer than I would have been allowed to do, but we're not required to move away from the seals if they enter into the space that we humans are required to keep. So I hold my breath and try to suppress audible laughter. Mm -hmm. And now the baby is moving, is nosing my black rubber boot, rubbing up against it and then against my knee. I hold very still, almost frozen, except for the sharp, breaths, an uncontrollable smile that are now taking over my entire corpus. Nothing else exists in this moment except the wieners, huge, black, glassy eyes fixed on mine. He nudges closer and puts his mouth on my knee, then my chest, my neck. He's climbing forward and his chest is now resting on my knee. I know I'm not supposed to touch him, I know about right and wrong. <laughs> but the back of my left hand rubs his belly. And I can confirm this because I have a photograph that, that shows it that somebody took. It shows me breaking the rules. As I feel <laughs> his wet, slippery skin on the hand that is petting him, his closed muzzle reaches forward a bit more and gently touches my chin. And now his mouth is on my lips on my cheek until finally he makes a deep nudge and places his entire muzzle on my left eye and forehead. All the while, his eyes are open just an inch from my own. <sighs> wow. Wow. That's a powerful experience, right? Yeah. That's powerful. I and and I want to underscore, I want to be very quick to take away from all that beauty and, and that amazing moment and say, 
I can have the same feeling with the, the juncos, a very common bird around here, who make dozens of nests on this property where I live now on this island, who have found my neighbor's bag of soil soil for the yard that she had open, made a nest unbeknownst to us, laid four eggs, and now there are four hatchlings who are in the nest who are growing wings. And that, that too can provide that, that same sense of exhilaration and awe with, with a very ordinary a bird. Some people don't even know the name of around here. People, you know, so ordinary, we don't pay much attention, right? But that also is extraordinary. So my emphasis in this chapter is, wow, there is all of this grand, amazing, phenomenal stuff going on and alive out there in the world. Some of it very different from how we look in this human body. We can connect with the, the ordinary, the everyday in our yards and have profound life altering experiences that way too. I agree. Well, that story, I'm, I had goosies like a bunch of times. It's crazy. <laughs> I mean, yes, I mean, uh, yes, you can have all these experiences in your own backyard or if you if you choose to go somewhere. Um, it's just really a matter of taking the time and being present in the moment yes. and, and, and yes. observing and all of that. You know, I was just thinking what recently happened for me was um, there was a, a nesting uh, pair of cardinals um, in this little bush in uh, my front patio. And um, I, you couldn't even see the nest. The only reason I knew there, there was one there is I always were seeing cardinals going in and out, in and out. But I even looked when I saw that they, the adult had left and I couldn't find the nest. It was so like, you know, buried somehow. I don't know how they got in there out of it. And, I, and when I went there, I could hear them going, you know, get away, you know. So I, I never went back to look. But one of the times I came back home, there was the baby cardinal on the steps oh. to my condo. It wasn't even fully feathered yet. And, oh. you know, it was just, you know, like a, a gift to see them while they were still not mature and, yes. and barely, pro probably barely flying at that point. So, I mean, it's just, it's just fun, right? I mean. Yes. And, and, and also it can be, it can be almost something seemingly mundane. I happen to love rocks. I build cairns, and um, which are, are rock kind of statues or, or, or buildings um, out in the natural world often, as, as I know a lot of other people do. But I, I just quickly want to say, for example, last week I, I had the um, great, great honor and um, pleasure of being in two college classrooms um, introducing my writing on the landscape practices to these young, youngish students, um, community college age, some of them traditional age students and some not, um, and, and many who have come from other places who are now in the U.S. studying. And we, we did in, in activity, the professor and I in this class, asking students to bring in something from the natural world. And um, one, one young woman had asked her little brother to go out and, and cut a rose for her from the bush in the yard. It was her homework, but she wanted help. So she asked him to get her something. And another woman brought a, a rock and another guy brought a pebble um, from someplace in Northern California that he had um, found that was special because it was different from all the other pebbles in this, this area that, that he went to visit. Um, and, and, and every, and, and they, each person who brought these things seemingly from, from right outside, from their porch or their yard or from a, a road trip, the only road trip they might've taken to a particular place, had a story. Um, so somebody else had a kind of a dry twig that, that had come off a, a, a bush and there was a whole story about what the, the dry twig was and what it meant and its strength and how that, that was helping this person see um, her own strength. And I, I just think these stories are beautiful and it's that tiny, it can be anything. It can be the dragonfly, I mean, damselfly that I found inside my house. I've never had a damselfly or dragonfly in my house, but yesterday morning there was, there was a damselfly and I very gingerly carried her out and put her in with my pansies. Um, I wasn't sure quite how well she was, um, but I went out later to try and get a better photograph and she was gone. So apparently she was well enough to fly off, but that's, that's a beautiful experience. 
so may you all have those. <laughs> exactly. And I love that you said she and her, because, you know, in some of the work that I've written, it's so important for me to, to stop calling things it, you know, mm -hmm. um, and that they, and maybe we don't know the gender and then we can call it something else like, you know, they or something, you know, but, um, you know, I was thinking how much, how much different it would be to, if you were thinking about taking a tree down in our yard, mm -hmm. you know, well, that, that, that tree, it needs to go versus, well, she, she's, she's not in the right place or something like that. And you'd probably think twice or maybe never even think about, um, yeah. I just was noticing a couple of comments that um, I'd like to share with you in the chat room here. Um, Ellen says, I'm so grateful uh, to you, Jennifer. Your charter course mm -hmm. was the first one I signed up for and led me to volunteering with uh, the Charters Education Institute. And she helps Wonderful. me in, in the environment sector as well. So is that Ellen Surfity? I'm, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it, your last name correctly. It is. Oh, hi, Ellen. Hello, I remember you. <laughs> I wondered if that was you talking about the sea, moving to the sea. I've seen photos of, of your new place. Hi, wonderful to have you here. Thank you. <laughs> she says hi. <laughs> I see yeah. the hearts. Thank you. Heart emoji. Okay, I wasn't sure if you were seeing that. Yeah, I just saw that pop up. Well, we have five minutes left. Maybe we can tackle the very last theme of your book, um, unless you sure. have more questions uh, come in. But um, the last theme that, well, the last thing we already talked about first, but um, <laughs> one that we already talked about is, is the theme of the niche. And um, mm -hmm. I don't know if that's how you say it, people say it differently, but um, I love that you you talk about our roles in the world, like this physical, mental, and, and, and emotional role. So often we talk about these aspects of our lives, but you mm -hmm. added in another role, the spiritual role. Um, would you like to say more about the niche of spirituality in our lives? Ah, oh, gosh. Um, I don't know if I can say it concisely because this is another passion area for me. <laughs> um, when what what I will say is in my in my work with clients, I do. Um, I was just talking to to a friend about this yesterday. Um, that that w when we think about body, emotion, mind, and spirit, these these four aspects of ourselves, of human nature. Um, we, we all have a, a tendency toward one or two of this, these that are kind of our, our, based on our personality and our orientation to life, right? Kind of our go-to areas. Um, and in recent years for me in the last decade or a little bit more, and, and probably also longer ago in my life, spirituality has, has been one of those places that, um, I find natural when I cultivate it, but I can I can forget about in a moment, especially a moment where I'm not um, maybe behaving as, as compassionately or, or kindly as I would like, or I'm having some kind of difficulty. Um, but I think this this notion of finding, so so I say, I use, I call, I pronounce that word niche, um, but I know a lot of pe people pronounce it niche. I, I think maybe even Steve might say niche. I say niche for better or for worse, I'm not sure. Um, but I, I understood something. This is another chapter that as I wrote about it, I realized that it, I used to think about niche, maybe perhaps a little incorrectly, as sort of a, a, a locus, a place in which we're situated in the world or in a geography. But it really, um, in, in this chapter anyways, I talk about it really has much more to do with the role we play in this interconnected web of life. And so for me, I think spirituality is huge because that is the place for me that that overrides some of my more base human impulses, the reflexes where I'm not very proud of my behavior, or I wish that I had in a, a difficult moment chosen to say something more kindly, more compassionately, more inclusively. And so for me, it's really um, a, 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 the area of my life where I, I relearned how to be a member of the human community, a better, um, more more loving member of the human community, community, but also how I can be more loving toward the natural world to, to um, you know, not actually kill the thing that's in my house. Uh, you know, we get these humongous wolf spiders in our house and they're quite, 
creature like less like an insect and much more like a small pet um and and you know can i actually have the courage because they're I'm not afraid of spiders, but I'm a little nervous around these guys. They're big. Um, can I actually compassionately scoop him up and give him a new a new place to be outside? And so that's spirituality for me is kind of the regrounding back into the whole of the web of life. So that's my briefest remark. I think. <laughs> I know that I kind of because kind of, we could talk about this for a whole nother hour, but um, exactly as, as exactly. we can see, we're at we're almost at the top of the hour, and I'm just going to share my screen because we put up a couple of slides for um, upcoming things. But Great. before I do that, I still want to see your face, and I want to thank you uh, for being here with us today. What a delight it is to share time and space with you and to, to feel your heart and soul in the work that you do. So thank you so much. Hey, you're very welcome. And thank you, Kay. Thank you for your effort in, in creating a new thing, which is an environment sector read based on the charters, global reads, and also for your efforts creating these slides and creating the space for us to be together. Thank you so much. And also behind the scenes is Marcel. And I just want to thank Marcel too for being here and being the tech guru for us all today. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned her and I was going to too. <laughs> and thank you, Marcel. Um, uh, thanks everyone that was here today and those of you who are viewing it into the future um, for being a part of this environment sector read. Um, again, this is Jennifer Wilkoit and um, we have uh, future sector reads um, hopefully coming up and we definitely have global reads coming up. Um, if you're if you wanted to sponsor any of that, we would appreciate uh, donations. And uh, just a couple of slides here. Um, next week at this exact same time, um, nine nine uh, a.m. Central, seven a.m. Pacific. Jean Shinoda Bowman will be here with us. And that's exciting. I know. I'm so <laughs> thrilled. Actually, I'm meeting with her this afternoon to to talk about our read next week, and so I'll be. Uh, enjoying that conversation as well. And then uh, the following month, we have Joanna Macy coming on with her book, A Wild Book to the World. And so um, thank you again, Jennifer, so much. And thank you to the audience and to Marcel for her work in the back. Um, have a wonderful, wonderful day. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody. Bye.